church, Lord, that, that the members of this church will be a light, will be a beacon, that the activities and the things that we do will be a light and a beacon, so that way you can be glorified. Lord, we also think about the, the tithes and offerings that are being given so that way the missions and, and the ministries of the church can go. And we ask not only that you will bless that, Lord, but that you will also bless the giver. That as they give out of what you have given them, that you will continue to bless them. And that they will see that trusting in the Lord is good. And that you always provide, Lord. We ask all these things in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen.
so that they may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. For though I am absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly you are and how firm your faith in Christ is. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live in Him, rooted and built up in Him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, and overflowing with thankfulness. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. Let us pray. And so, Father God, we thank you again for your word. We pray that now, as Olivia comes, she will be quickened by your spirit, that we will be quickened, that we might hear and understand well, and be enabled to apply it to our lives today and always. In Christ's name, with thanksgiving. Amen. Tell you these things so that no one can deceive you. 
You may remember from our Seven Churches series, we talked a little bit about a place called Laodicea. This is one of the three cities that was part of a tight-knit group of trading and community, which Colossae was a part of. And so understanding a little bit about the city we already met in our Seven Churches series, we can understand a little bit more about Colossae. Now, Laodicea was known for their trading and their fine cloths and their metallurgy and these wonderful things. And we know that their trading with the port city of Colossae was really important for both cities. Both cities really depended on one another. And so we see a lot of similar needs in both communities. We see not only in their trade, but also in the way that they lived their lives. See, Laodicea, Hierapolis, which was the third city, and Colossae, they all experienced the same daily life and pressures. They were trading cities, especially this port city of Colossae, and they experienced the same cultural, social, religious diversity that maybe you wouldn't see in other parts of Rome at the time. They had this bounty of all different belief systems that were right there. But yet, in this chapter and this book as a whole, Colossae isn't receiving rebukes for mixing with other religions and, and taking little parts of other belief systems and bringing it into their daily life. Instead, what we see here is that they're being cautioned not to mingle and not to be deceived by really sound arguments. You see, when I was growing up in the church, I was often under the impression that if something was bad, I'd know. I just had this feeling because it would be super obvious. But Paul is warning Colossae and us that things that are not quite our faith, but sound pretty similar to our faith, are just as dangerous. The things that are pretty close are just as dangerous as the things that are wildly different than our faith. So despite the potential that they could have been rebuked for all these big things, Instead, they're cautioned about the smallest of things. The things that sound the most convincing, the things that sound the same as what they're seeing in Scripture, but aren't quite. They're careful reminders and encouragement to hold on to what is true. Paul saw their commitment to faith and uses this letter as the opportunity to remind them that false hopes can feel true. And that's what I'd like to talk about today. False hopes can feel true. We've talked about the importance of finding freedom and hope and understanding the supremacy of Christ over the last few weeks. Being all in. And these are all critical things for our faith, but it's really important to note that all of these things tend to line up with how we feel about Christ. We have to make sure that how we think about Christ is just as careful as what we feel about Christ. It's really easy to put that pedestal up, right? It is good to experience emotional connection. Don't get me wrong. It is wonderful to have that emotional connection in our faith. But we must be like the Bereans that we heard about in our earlier scripture passage and critically evaluate the things that we're taking in. How easy is it for you to hop online on your smartphone or on your tablet or your computer, whatever you access and see an enticing story that's on the news. How easy is it to be informed by something very quickly? It's right at your fingertips. It's right there. It's so easy to find information. But it's not always true, even if it sounds pretty close to true, right? We see all the time these false hopes or this false truth that can feel very real. False hopes can feel very real real. Paul prays the Colossians. We see that throughout the letter. He's praising them for being so careful not to mix with other things. But at the same time, he's telling them all treasures and all wisdom come from Christ. So there's a warning being given here. Be careful because things may not always be what they appear. This man who came and tried to find the Northwest Passage, he brought back total of almost 5,000 tons of gold back to England. The first journey, he brought back a sample of this ore. It was a special type of gold ore, and the king's metallurgist that he brought in to see it confirmed this is 
be gold, go get more. And so they brought back 5,000 tons. The question was, were their eyes being critical enough of what they had found? When I was a child, I remember that there were a lot of movies that were produced by Disney and others that were pretty convincing arguments in them. My parents understanding their role as my parents and, and making sure that I was raised understanding what was true and what was not true sat me down after some of these movies and reminded me, okay, this sounded really convincing. What did you take away from this movie? Okay, does that line up with what we believe about the world? Does that match with science? Does that match with scripture? Does that match with all these other things that are critically important for me as I learn and grow? And that was really good, but do you know what I remember more than the moments when I looked at movies like Pocahontas or Harry Potter or some of the others? I remember when we talked about the Christian movies and the Christian books that I had read that were not quite in line with Christ. Because they sounded pretty close to true, but they weren't quite lining up with scripture. I remember some kids' movies that were Christmas themed that had a lot more to do with Santa and fruitcake than they ever had to do with what the story behind Christmas was. And there was a disconnect for me because Jesus was just the baby in the manger that Santa dropped a present off for in this one movie. And what does that do for us? Things that seemed really convincing for me as a child don't seem as convincing now, but there's a lot of other things that do seem pretty convincing for us, right? False hopes can feel very real, and we have to remember that. Do we prematurely lower our guards on what we're seeing because we hear, oh, this is written by such and such an author, and I know they're a Christian? Or do we prematurely lower our guards because oh yeah, this, this person seems on the level. Yeah, okay, I'll trust what they say in every area. Are we lowering our guards and hearing false hopes and thinking that they're very real? See, if false hopes can feel real, which we can see that they do, Paul's cautions here need to be taken with really great care. He warns us that being taken captive through philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition or according to the elemental spirits of the universe, it's dangerous. And we look at that and we say, oh, who's going to be taken captive by the elemental spirits of the universe? We have science. We know how things work now. We understand how the world kind of goes. And there's a lot of other things that we can say take us captive very easily today, as opposed to what might have been very true in the trading city of Colossae. These fantastic tales that would come with shipmates as they docked in Colossae and told of this incredibly spiritual moment that they had and came to the city. Okay, they're hearing things about elemental spirits of the universe. What are things that we take in by our exposure to other communities and other cultures that don't necessarily line up with scripture? What are things that we're taking in that don't necessarily line up with scripture? In my lifetime, I've seen a pretty dramatic shift within the church in our perception of marriage. As members of the community, we've gotten this view, divorce is really wrong. And we've held on to that, and we understand that that comes from scripture, that we see divorce isn't what God wants for our families. And so to try to stop that from happening, sometimes we encourage our young people to trial marriage before they go into a marriage. And I've heard this from people that tried to counsel David and I before we got married, saying, well, have you lived together yet? Do you know how you function together as a couple? Do, do you see how you work together before you get married? Because once you're married, I mean, your only option is divorce, and we don't talk about that. Like, this isn't something that we want to get into with the church. So, so maybe test things out first. And it's little things like that that seem really convincing because we don't want broken families. We don't want hurting people. We don't want individuals that are left with hurts. That's not what God wants. But he doesn't want us to hurt ourselves from doing other things either. Marriage was designed in a way that we can be built up as a family. And it's really easy to think, well, I'll just 
safeguard myself by doing this little side thing to see if this marriage will really work before I get into a marriage. It sounds convincing, right? But that's not the only types of convincing that we've seen in our lives. False hopes can seem really, really real. Sometimes it's about how we value those around us. We see this an awful lot when someone passes away, and then we're left to deal with the estate. I remember when my grandmother passed away, and I won't say which one, <laughs> but when one of my grandmothers passed away, I remember the fighting over the expensive treasures that lived in a box just like this, the jewelries, the rings, the special things that, you know, they're worth money. And I remember people fighting over things like that, and I remember wondering why. I was a child, I mean, I didn't totally get the value of things yet, but I couldn't figure out why, because nowhere in scripture did it ever say anything about valuing these types of things in terms of like, oh, grandma died, let's take the rings. Instead, it's just a mindset that has creeped into our lives that sometimes we don't necessarily realize. It's a pattern within our community that doesn't come from Christ. And so we get so tied up in that, oh, I need this treasure to remember my mom or my dad or, or my spouse guy, and we miss out on the little things that can remind us the most of them. On his return to Canada, Martin Frobisher collected thousands of tons of this gold ore that he found. Thousands of tons. He transported them back to England with more and more captives each time, more and more indigenous peoples that he drug out of their communities to convince the king this is gold. He didn't know what gold was. They didn't know. And so he brings them all back in these thousands of tons of ore back to England, only to find out it's not gold at all. It was fool's gold. One of the first times that they discovered fool's gold was at the expense of many, many lives and thousands of tons being transported across the sea in wooden boats. Exciting, right? False hopes can feel very real. He thought he was a very rich man. And after years and years of working and spending his whole later life dedicated to finding this gold, he found out it was fool's gold. What is the source of our truth? Better yet, when people ask us for truth, what source do we offer them? When someone tells us of a crisis that's going on in their life, when they're feeling the hurts of going through messy lives, what do we offer them? Do we say, oh, my, my thoughts and prayers are with you? Or do we stop and we pray with them in that moment? Do we offer them the balm of the Holy Spirit as a comfort, or do we just say, oh, positive thoughts, we'll be thinking of you, we'll be praying for you? How do we get to a point where positive thoughts, good energies, are our response when someone tells us that they're hurting? Because the argument sounds really, really plausible, right? It's a good thing to think positive thoughts for someone, right? It's a good frame of mind. You're building up your thoughts. We can go on and on and talk about this. But what it does is it takes away our moment. It takes away our moment to stop and pray. It takes away the source of truth, the actual hope that we can offer someone. Do we tell the truth in love when someone tells us that they're going through something? Or do we offer them the false hopes that feel real? I want to encourage you that when we are confronted by plausible arguments, it's totally acceptable to push back and ask, is this really in line with scripture? And that goes for when you're hearing us from the pulpit as well. I would want you to ask me, does that really line up with scripture? rather than sit at home and wonder and wonder and wonder and just say, okay, I guess it does. I guess it does. As pastors, we want you to feel empowered to engage with your faith at a level that you're embracing it in your lives and it is changing your hearts. Not just saying, okay, I 
heard the pastor say this, this is nice, this is good, this is wonderful. When we really engage with scripture, the chance for us to be blinded by these false hopes is a lot less. Because we are critically thinking. We're not just passionately embracing our faith. We are critically thinking, yes, I affirm this or I don't agree with this because I don't believe it's there in scripture. Paul encourages Colossae to do that. And we encourage you to do that as individuals here at Newington as well. You see, we can get tied up with the mindset of the world, which is find all the fancy things in the box, bring them home, all these earthly treasures. But as one commentator said, as we talked about the treasures in Colossae too, finding treasures outside of Christ is doomed to fail. They'll be wonderful for a time, but they don't last. What does last when we value people over things are, are the wonderful memories that come with not, not the jewelry that's in here, but the Tupperware cups. We spend more time around my grandmother's table drinking out of these silly little cups, which we have to refill 15 times and spend all day talking about wonderful stories from our lives than they ever did with any of the jewelry that came in this box. The things don't matter. False hopes end up fruitless. Nothing comes from false hope other than pain, other than hurt. So when we look at the treasure chest, the things that we hold up in our lives, what are we filling it with? What are we taking in? And what is the source of our truth? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to ask you to be with us as we discern your word and discern your will for our lives. Lord, we, we trust you and we know that you desire all good things to be for our lives. And so we pray, knowing that you are God who hears us and who is always with us and has created us with the best of intentions. Lord, we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit that you are willing to